Hi everyone, my name is Dylan Rambo. I'm a PhD student at Northern Illinois University and today I want to talk to you about the p-adic numbers. Now a more clickbaity title to this video might have been something like how to invent new numbers because in order to explain to you what the p-adic numbers are I want to first go through a journey of how we came, how we humans came to invent all of the other numbers that we know and love. In particular, all of the real numbers. The first numbers that human beings would have come up with thousands of years ago are what we today call the natural numbers, or we sometimes call them the counting numbers. And we call them the counting numbers because they're the numbers that we count with. One, two, three, four, five, etc. And they're also called the natural numbers because they're the ones that humans would naturally seek to invent. They would look around the things they have in front of them and start counting them. Okay, so after they invented those numbers, early humans would have sought to invent the number zero. Because it's important to describe the lack of something. And it's also good to have a zero for, to act as a placeholder. Otherwise, it's kind of difficult to represent a number like 106. Also, mathematically speaking, it's good to have zero because it serves as an additive identity. It's good to have a number that if you add it to any other number, the value doesn't change. And that's an important function that the number zero serves. And the next set of numbers that human beings would have wanted to invent are negative numbers. Specifically, the negatives of all of those natural numbers that they'd come up with. And so that's good for the purpose of describing debt. If you sell away so many items, you want to be able to say you have negative three whatevers. But also mathematically, it's good that now we can do problems like two minus three. And we have a number to represent what that subtraction is. And we have those number, those negative numbers also give us additive inverses. So for every net positive natural number, there's its negative, and when you add them together, that equals zero, the additive identity. That's an excellent thing. So with having all of these numbers now, we together call all of these numbers the integers. Those natural numbers, one, two, three, four, five, etc zero, and the negatives of all of those natural numbers. And in modern language, those form what we call an abelian group. It's an, we say abelian because the addition is commutative, we have the additive identity, we have additive inverses. Fantastic. But not only can we do addition and subtraction with these integers, we can multiply them as well. You know, every two, num two integers, we can multiply them together and get another integer. This multiplication behaves nicely with respect to addition. By that, I mean we have the distributive property. We have a multiplicative identity, the number one. If you multiply any integer times one, it doesn't change. This multiplication is even commutative. Again, fantastic. Only problem is, we don't have multiplicative inverses. There isn't a number that I can take two and multiply it by and have that equal the multiplicative identity one like I can do with addition. So because of that, we had, it, we had to invent fractions in order to have multiplicative inverses of all of our integers. And of course, it's good to have fractions for other reasons to describe having one half of something. And a length being half of a foot or whatever unit of measurement. Being able to say expressions like that is important as well. So if we take all of those integers and, and all fractions, all things that look like one integer divided by another, together we call that the set of rational numbers and those form what we call a field because now we can do we can have multiplicative inverses for all of our numbers except for zero so fantastic we have the field of rational numbers it is worth mentioning though that to formally make the field of rational numbers we do have to 
throw in this little equivalence relation we call it where we say that one half is equivalent to two over four and things like that. We don't want to have these repeats. So once we have that in place, now we formally have the field of rational numbers. But I'm sure that everyone watching already knows that there exist things called irrational numbers, such as pi or e. So how to formally make an irrational number? Well, one way to do it is through what we call sequences. Now, I'm going to assume that everyone watching this video it has at one point taken a calculus class and at least knows what sequences are. So, the way we formally construct pi is as the limit of a sequence of all rational numbers, like this one here. There's actually many ways to do this. Here's another example of how to define pi as a limit of a sequence. And just for good measure, here's a couple different ways to define the number e as the limit of some of these sequences. So one important thing to note about all of these sequences is that the subsequent terms of the sequence are getting closer and closer to each other. When a sequence has that, we call it a Cauchy sequence. So any irrational number can be described as the limit of a Cauchy sequence where all the entries in the sequence come from the rational numbers. So that leads us to this. The way we formally define the set of real numbers is the rational numbers plus all of the limits of Cauchy sequences of rational numbers. And kind of like we did with forming the rational numbers where we throw out all equivalent fractions and say that they're the same, all of the different ways that you can make a Cauchy sequence that converges to pi, we don't have a different pi for each one. We say they're all the same and they're all just the one number pi. So when we do this, we say that the real numbers are the topological completion of the rational numbers. Now there's something you need to realize about this. We did this with, all with respect to our usual definition of distance. Remember we said the entries of the sequence are getting closer to each other. Well, that goes to our usual way of defining the distance between two rational numbers being just the absolute value of their subtraction. We can do all of this because that function, that distance function, defines what we call a metric, and that just means it meets all of these properties. That last property there is what we call the triangle inequality. Now, here's the kicker. This is not the only way to define a metric for the rational numbers. Okay. The other way we do it is what we call the p-adic metric, and here's how that works. So first, pick your favorite prime number and call that number p. We're going to define the p-adic absolute value of a generic rational number, a over b. So first thing you do is you take that rational number and factor all factors of that prime number p out of it. Remember, we have the unique factorization of all integers in terms of the products of prime, so that's really helpful here. Once you've done that and you've written it in this form here, where you have p to some exponent, could be positive, could be negative, depending on how, whether you have factors of p in your numerator or denominator. Once you've done that, we define the p adic absolute value of a over b to be p to the negative power of whatever that exponent you came up with a step ago. That's the p adic absolute value. So then the p adic distance between two rational numbers will be the p adic absolute value of their subtraction. And then once we throw in the caveat that the p adic absolute value of zero is zero, this now gives us enough to define a p adic metric on the set of rational numbers. In fact, this metric is sometimes called an ultrametric because instead of just the usual triangle inequality, the one that we had from the usual uh, uh, on the rational numbers, this one satisfies the strong triangle inequality, which means exactly what's written here. So then, just like how the real numbers 
are the topological completion of the rational numbers with respect to that usual distance metric, the field of p-adic numbers is the topological completion of the rational numbers with respect to the p-adic metric. So you take the usual rational numbers, add into that set all limits of Cauchy sequences with respect to this p-adic metric. And these p-adic numbers still define a field, so you can add, subtract, multiply, and divide them, so long as you don't divide by zero. The distributive property still holds, and everything else that comes along with being a field. Furthermore, these p-adic fields are different for every different choice of the prime number p. I want to mention really quickly that these fields of p-adic numbers even though they're still fields like the real numbers are, and they're topological completions of Q just like the real numbers are, all of these fields have, these p-adic fields have very different properties than the real numbers do. And that's due in part to the fact that these p-adic numbers satisfy this strong triangle inequality where the real numbers don't. But that's a more complicated video for a different time perhaps. One more thing I want to mention, though, is that the unit ball in the p-adic field, defined here, is what we call the ring of integers of the p-adic numbers. And, well, I say ring because it does indeed define a ring. You can check that with the strong triangle inequality. But also, the notation of calling it the ring of integers makes sense because every integer will have p-adic absolute value less than or equal to 1 for every different prime number p, in fact. You can check that as well. I definitely invite you to do so. So this has been your introduction to the p-adic numbers. If you have suggestions of other topics you'd like us to cover, leave those in the comments. Or if you're a gradu graduate student yourself and would like to film a video for us, please do get in touch. Thanks for watching and thanks for learning.